Testing, 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 testing. Hello, Johnny. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. I That's thought right. I, I got it right, but I couldn't see the second link for the password. That's all right. I'm sorry about all the technical issues. This is the problem with using WebEx. Um, when we use Zoom, it's really easy, just in and out. But WebEx, you have passwords if you're a host, passwords if you're a panelist, passwords if you're an attendee, password. Just Who made this stuff? Yeah, it is. It is. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. I'm uh, gonna blur my background. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I see the guy behind me working. Oh, <laughs> nice. Fair enough. Um, so, so just um, to let you know. Oh, yes. sorry. Go ahead. No, if you got a question, go ahead. Um, maybe you want to let the other panelists know that there is two passwords. One is the web web password, and the other one right below that is the one that they need to go through. Yeah, I'll let them know just now. Um, yeah. Send a quick. Email. Well, you know what? Maybe no no blurry is easier. It looks horrible. Yeah, WebEx. Uh, 
Um, thank you, by the way, for taking part in this. Hey, it's my pleasure. It'll be fun. I hope. Yeah, I hope too. <laughs> uh, yeah, my boss is watching, so I really hope. Um, if you're having trouble joining my best, remember that there are two passwords to join and to be on the panel. Here they are. Um, so, da, 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 webinar password. Yeah, I completely missed the one from the bottom that said. Um... Yeah, it's so crazy that there's so much of it. Here we go. Boom. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, hopefully that one too. And oh, yep, I just got your password. I mean, got your email. Um, so yeah, I hope they're here. Uh, so yeah, just briefly, Johnny, I had uh, a bowl down your bio. So I'm going to introduce you like this. Let me know if it's okay. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, so Johnny Wu, a native Clevelander, but raised in Central America, is a veteran award-winning filmmaker, founder of Cleveland Indie Club, co-founder of the Cleveland Asian Festival, as well as a producer for the Cleveland Cultural Gardens One World Day. Johnny's involvement in civic engagement includes public speaking and serving as a board member for several community initiatives. That's good enough. Grand, and I think we just got Agatha. Agatha, are you there? I think you might be on mute and the camera might be off. Can you hear me? Uh, if you'll see on the bottom, Agatha, just like Zoom, you'll see something that says mute and stop video. I mean, you're joined. <laughs> You're here. Do you see me? I hear you. I don't see you yet. Not yet. Um, you have to start a video, unfortunately, with WebEx. There you go. Now we see you and we hear you. Hello. Hey, hello. I have no idea if I, I have to close the door. I'm in my office. So you tell me if this is okay. Looks good. Yeah. Looks good. Yep. You look good. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're all in our offices today, um, but that's very, very normal. Very normal. How are you feeling, Agatha? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know. That's okay. I, I have no idea why I'm here. <laughs> you're, you're here. You're here because you represent uh, your own experience and our students oh, will benefit wow, wow. from hearing your experience. As mm -hmm. far as I represent my own experience, that's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're here because we're talking today about culture and how we uh, continue to maintain our culture while we're living in the United States, including how we promote our culture in our community, including how we have our culture for our children. Um, sure, speaking of which, Johnny, uh, do you have children yourself? Yeah, I do. No? Okay, but Agatha, you've got two, is that right? I have one and he's a, he's 26. He's a college graduate and I have a long story about culture and him. Perfect. Yeah, yeah that's, that's fine. Good. That's fine. Ah, that, first, I will tell me, mm -hmm. do you hear me well when I'm sitting a little bit far away from my, uh, phone mm -hmm. because I'm using the phone. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Here you fine. Yep. You're fine. Absolutely fine. Uh, actually, I just want to tell you, I'm going to, uh, introduce you. Um, so I took your bio. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, I had to ask you, how do I pronounce your last name? Like, pretend that it's a V, like Voinovich. And Voinovich. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not Voinovich. I'm Voino, but there was a senator Voinovich. So oh, remember, yeah. mm -hmm. like I a do. V, Voino. Voino. V O Y N O. That's not my last name, but to pronounce, it's a good one. Perfect, perfect. So here's what I have I have uh, Agatha Voino originally from Poland, is the editor-in-chief of the magazine and forum of the Polish American Cultural Center, as well as serving as a counselor at residential men's program here in Parma. Agatha is a first-generation immigrant who's also a graduate of Tri-C's ESL program, as well as our Women in Transition program. Yes, that's good. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to get started in a few minutes. So I don't have to, only two of us? 
No, there should be a third. Shoba should be here. I don't know where she is. I've sent, I've been sending her emails all morning. She hasn't replied. So she uh -oh. may be coming a little bit later, I hope. If not, then it's okay. The three of us is absolutely fine. And I'm ready. Let's go ahead. Let's do it. Right. We should and, have... And I'm okay to sit like that. I don't have to change anything. Nope. Nope. You're absolutely fine. You're absolutely okay. fine. Well, yeah, if you, but if you go away, but, but oh, come no, back, no. but come back, but yeah, no, you're absolutely fine. You both look good. Um, we're expecting, I'm not sure how many we're expecting. I've asked, um, several, uh, teachers to send their classes, but, uh, we will see, we will see. And, uh, you guys had the questions, which I sent. So, you know, the kind of questions which will be coming, obviously, if something comes up during the discussion, you know, I'll redirect or ask for a question. And then if we have any questions from the audience at the end, we'll answer with that and we'll be finished by four o'clock. Okay. okay. Great. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with, do, do, do. so there we go. You guys can see that. That's our opening panel. Um, obviously Shoba's not here, so we'll see about that. Um, and we should get attendees coming in next few minutes. And Agatha, thank you very much for doing this, by the way. Excuse me. Thank you very much for taking yeah. part. I'm not very prepared being honest with you. That's fine. No, it's a natural conversation. It's a natural conversation. Every uh, webinar we've had this week has been really good because it's just people talking and sharing their opinions. So it's absolutely fine. You know, uh, only thing I ask is please don't uh, swear. Don't use any swear words, but <laughs> I think that's fine. Um, <laughs> let me see. New panelists. Da, 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 da. Just checking that we've got everything on. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know what I wanted to do. Wait for a second. I think that I'm going to turn my uh, cell phone on with the um, charger. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so it's three o'clock. We should get started. Um, hello, everybody who's attending. Um, so far, I have a couple of attendees. There should be some more coming along. Um, we're going to wait uh, a couple of minutes just so everybody can be joining in. As you can see, this is uh, maintaining our culture, part of our Culture Share Week here at Tri-C in the Western Campus, uh, where I'm from and where I'm going. My name is David Napak, and I have with me two of our panelists. Do you hear me, David? I certainly can, Agatha. Yep, we're good. We're going to get started in one minute. Just waiting for a few more attendees to come in. How many we have? Um, so far, five or six, but they're coming every second, coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. So. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, we'll get started at 3.02. Should probably play some music while we're waiting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, welcome everybody to Maintaining Culture, the last panel of the Tri C Culture Share Week, where I'm from and where I'm going. My name is David Napak. I'm your moderator for today. I'm a ESL lecturer here at the Western Campus, and I've been teaching English as a second language for over 20 years. But originally, I come from Scotland and the UK, so I know a thing or two about maintaining culture. Joining me today 
one of our uh, panelists is unfortunately not here, but we still have Agatha Voino and Johnny Wu. Agatha Voino and Johnny Wu. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Hello. hello. So, so Agatha is originally from Poland. She's the editor in chief of the magazine and forum of the Polish American Cultural Center, as well as serving as a counselor at a residential men's program here in Parma. Agatha is a first generation immigrant who's also a graduate of Tri-C's ESL program, as well as our Women in Transition program. Thanks for being here, Agatha. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here. And Johnny Wu is a native Clevelander, but raised in Central America. He's a veteran award-winning filmmaker, the founder of the Cleveland Indie Club, co-founder of the Cleveland Asian Festival, as well as a producer for the Cleveland Cultural Gardens One World Day. Johnny's involvement in civic engagement includes public speaking and serving as a board member for several community initiatives. Good to have you here, Johnny. Thank you for having me, David. So guys, we're gonna to talk today about how we maintain our culture. And first, let me just start off by asking you, Johnny, what does maintaining your culture look like for you in your everyday life? I guess when I wake up in the morning, it just started being part of my culture uh, because I do a lot of work with the community itself. So when, when, when I go out there and uh, wake up and sit in front of a computer, the first thing I do right now, this, this week, has been about Cleveland Asian Festival. So lots of organizing, a lot of planning, a lot of preparation uh, to, to get everything going. So that's something that uh, is part of my life, part of my culture, part of my day-to-day, uh, -day, like martial art, and it's the same way too. So you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about that. Uh, when we go to this getting to this uh, celebration, like holidays, uh, like the Lunar New Year celebration, the Moon Festival, etc. Then when you wake up in the morning, you have a little bit more uh, responsibility to do instead of providing that information in, in, in respecting that. So I think that's very much a part of my life. And I think I'm very blessed to be able to understand that that is something I want to continue being part of it. That's great. Thank you, Johnny. And uh, Shoba's just joined us as well. Hello, Shoba. No, I'm sorry. My there was some problem with my sign on. It just kept going round and round. Wasn't able to sign on. I'm so sorry. It's not a problem. Not at all. Thank you for having us here. So, um, Shoba, if you could just introduce yourself to the panel and to uh, the group, that'd be great. Hi, my name is Shoba Narayan, and uh, I teach uh, Indian classical dancing here in the uh, Greater Cleveland area. I have my dance school here, and I've been teaching for over 25 years. So um, that's my introduction. Wonderful. Well, thanks for having us, Shoba. Thank you. And so we're talking about maintaining our culture. And as Johnny said, a lot of maintaining our culture is about organizing and being part of a community initiative. Um, Agatha, how does your culture uh, affect your everyday life? I think that my experience is very similar to my, uh, to my colleague here. Um, the panelist, because I wake up and I know that I'm very connected with the culture. So when I was thinking about um, talking about the culture, I was thinking about integration uh, with the culture versus assimilation. And I feel very much assimilated with, with America, but on the other hand, um, I have a Polish husband, so we speak Polish. And um, I've been in United States for 27 years. It's a long time for me. Um, he is being here only for 15 years. So it's a, a little bit of the different experience and opposition into the 27 years. So sometimes we have a, sometimes even within our culture, I see that we have a differences, you know, to understand the Polish culture because me being here for a long time and him being here for a half of that time is just the different stages, which is absolutely normal. And this is, uh, those are the stages that we immigrants are going through. So as my um, previous panelist, I, I really am very connected because I'm connected with the Polish organization, which is Polish American Cultural Center, which I'm going to talk about it today, probably a lot, just to let you um, all know about uh, our organization and what we do. And on top of me belonging to the organization and being the editor in chief of the magazine that we it's a small uh, publication which of course i have it with me <laughs> um uh, but my my husband is a director there so we're really um involved uh 
into the community, Polish community here in Cleveland. Everyday life, I don't know what else I do every day. I don't even think about maintaining my culture every day life. The thing is that we speak Polish, my husband and I, we do speak Polish. And even, uh, you have asked um, privately if I, uh, if I have kids, even my son, who is an adult, and, 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 and he was born here, he prefers to speak with me with, in Polish, which is always very surprising for me because sometimes I think that he really doesn't get it. But he really does, but he's just slower in Polish than, than, than of course, than in English, right? Mm. And I'm saying to him, why do you don't want to speak English? And then uh, the answer is, mom, because if I will not talk to you, I'm not talking to anybody in Polish. I'm not using my language and I'm going to lose it and I don't want to lose it. That's that's oh. exactly the great point, Agatha. Yeah, exactly. Maintaining our culture is really a, a question of how much we use it in our every everyday life. And Shoba, you're uh, obviously teaching part of your culture and being able to educate others. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what kind of thing that you teach at your school? I teach um, Indian classical dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Bharatanatyam, which is uh, the oldest among classical dance forms originating from South India. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, the, for me, holding on, to, keeping my culture alive, Bharatanatyam, the dance plays a big, big role. Dance and music are integral part of Indian culture, actually. So, and the dance that I teach, most of them are religious, uh, Hinduism based. And um, most of the dances that we teach do talk about mythological stories and talk about gods and goddesses and it's almost like a prayer mm. so for me to teach that to the children that are growing up here definitely um helps me form a bond between the two cultures and um i think uh, like agatha said you know it's uh I, I don't have to really think about wake up every morning and think how am i going to assimilate in this culture or how am i going to be part of this culture. I think we're very fortunate that we have the best of two cultures. Mm. So we have taken, at least I have taken the best of both cultures. We Indian culture and um, uh, is, is very, very deep rooted in us. It is impossible to separate us from the, uh, the cultural background and say, Hey, you know, this is, you need to be part of the mainstream. So you need to forget your culture. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way. But um, I do teach my children with the, who come to the dance class traditions about, especially about how we treat our teachers, which is very, very mm -hmm. important in the Eastern culture of, uh, uh, you know, with, with the respect and uh, uh, certain things that we show to our teachers or the gurus, as we call them, which mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. which I feel is lacking in Western culture. So mm -hmm. that was that was my major culture shock when I came into this country, I think, uh, more than 35 years ago. I have lived in the U.S. longer than I have lived in India. I came here mm -hmm. when I was 20 years old. So um, and assimilating and getting into this culture, into the mainstream wasn't a problem, mainly because we didn't have a problem with the language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and language is a wonderful a starting point because obviously part of our culture and part of maintaining culture is to do with language. Um, Johnny, you were born in Cleveland, but raised in Central America. So you speak uh, English, Spanish and Chinese. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So which of those languages would be the dominant one for you when you're thinking or reacting or dreaming? All depending on the moment. Uh, right at this point, English would be the, the, the my dominant one. Um, my first language is uh, English, and then Spanish, and then Chinese. So the the part of Chinese is fading away just because I don't talk to a lot of people in Chinese. But when I had the chance to, uh, you 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 usually are naturally speak, speaking what comes out, and I can do it is easier than most of the time. But it takes a little transition. So I need to be an, an involved with a bunch of different Chinese person. And we would probably talk for a couple of days and then it would go very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. So that that takes some some time. Uh, I used to be a translator back in in Panama. So uh, this kind of thing happened a lot where I could be talking to one person in English and suddenly accidentally talking Spanish and back and forth. So that's something I got to use to a lot to understand how to make it work. So 
yeah, the dominant language at this point right now is English. If I'm in a different surrounding, it would change. It was in the, in the, in the Hispanic surrounding, it would become probably Spanish within a few days. And do you find that when it changes in a different situation, it changes uh, sort of your mindset or your feelings towards something? It does a little bit, it just because the culture is a little bit different. Um, the Chinese culture, mostly we are very much uh, uh, inclusive to ourselves and more um, quiet and more respectful in the sense of the way that we treat our elders and this and that. Whereas the Hispanic culture is a little more the machismo kind of mentality. So when I get to that environment, I become a little more machismo based and maybe more vocal about certain things. Uh, when I go to the English uh, that language, it becomes a little bit more the assimilating into the American culture in, in that sense. Because I grew up in a very much in the Western culture, so sometimes it's a little hard to be understanding the, the Asian culture of, me, of myself, my, my background. But yet I maintain that because of my father also being, uh, what a quote unquote, in, in, in making it very inclusive into our Chinese culture and make sure that I can be able to. Uh, Remember the, the 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 different things that my father had done for 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 us, and remember the different uh, value that we have in our family. Yeah, great. That's a great one. Thank you. And Agatha, speaking of language, you you know you work as an editor in chief, so you have to write in Polish, um, but at the same time translate into English. Um, and when you said that at home you're talking with your husband in Polish, do you find yourself switching very often between the two languages, and does that cause confusion for you at all? Um, I, I think that um, I think that this is what I do lately. Somebody said a while ago to me that when you're gonna have a dreams in English, then you are assimilated with America or whatever. You're okay with with, with English. So that that is happening all the time. Like uh, I don't even know which language I'm thinking in. Um, very often, very often, I'm finding myself. Um, thinking that, oh my gosh, I'm looking for a word in Polish. And then, well, but I don't have a good word in English to this one too. I mean, those languages are very different, like extremely, extremely different. Sometimes I'm finding English as an easier language for me to express my feelings and emotions and myself. Also, what is interesting that, uh, that, that also somebody said, uh, one of my friends a while ago, that when you are arguing, especially with your spouse, try to do it in English. I mean, you know, in the beginning when you're not fluent, because then you have to pause and think. Or maybe you're not that very uh, fluent with finding the exact uh, words and, and expression, then you have to think. And when you think, the emotions won't take control over you, right? So um, my my Polish language, I still consider as a good one. That's my main language. Uh, see, I'm very confused sometimes. That's my main language. What I what I told you before with this publication, what I experience, like sometimes when I'm writing the articles in Polish, I think in English and I take a notes in English and then I'm thinking, well, but my English is not my first language. Uh, my grammar, my style, everything is something what I got it here being here, but not like it, it, it's not like natural to me completely. So, of course, I do make mistakes. I mean, especially when I'm when I'm writing. So my writing in English is not that perfectly fluent with so much flowery words. So when somebody is translating me, then I'm thinking, wow, of course, I, I think like that, you know, but sometimes there are some subjects when I sit down and I write in English and I have somebody to read it and, and um, bring some correction to my article. So mainly I am at the point where I kind of go back and forth. And unfortunately, I use so much language, uh, English into my Polish, which makes some of my uh, friends, I think, not very, I mean, some people don't like it, okay? They are really strict about uh, Polish only, okay? So I, 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 I have a situations when, when people say to me, hey, can you speak Polish? And then I say, didn't I? I mean, I didn't even notice that, that I switched. And, and it goes very, very often. The same with my husband when I'm talking to him, all of a sudden I'm changing into English and I'm not realizing that, that I'm doing this. And sometimes people may think that this is some type of a game or whatever, or in purpose. No, absolutely not. 
interesting is when I go to Poland because my family is there and everybody's expecting that everything is the same because I've been here uh, uh, like this other uh, panelist here longer in America than in Poland. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. almost the same, but one year longer than, than, than I was in Poland. Mm -hmm. So my entire life actually was, uh, adult life was associated with America. When I go to Poland, I'm being uh, taken a little bit, a little bit awkward because uh, people think that um, those uh, words that I'm uh, incorporating into the conversation that this is some type of whatever it is, right? But it's just my normal thing. Sometimes I'm not. I'm. I'm, I'm just. I'm just talking like that. Well, the accent stays, of course. So how, uh, as you can hear, <laughs> I'm more polite than I think I am. <laughs> Fair enough. So, um, Shoba, for you, obviously, language is a, an important issue for all of us. But you find that you're doing your culture through your work. How much would you be in participating in your culture if it wasn't for your primary focus of work? That's an interesting question. I've never thought about uh, because this is dance is just so um, a part of me that I think, and my husband teaches Indian classical music too. But let me, when we spoke about uh, English, uh, talking about English or the language, I speak five different languages. So wow. I speak okay. my mother tongue. I speak mm -hmm. in, uh, English, of course. Mm -hmm. We have Hindi. I speak mm -hmm. Marathi. Mm -hmm. And I speak another South Indian language called Malayalam. So oh, okay. and I can understand a couple more Indian languages. But I think, I, I do think in English. I do not think in my in my, it, not even in my mother tongue, I think in English and, uh, and uh, like the accent goes, I think when we go back, when I go back to India, I'm very comfortably able to switch back to a so-called Indian accent and mm. not have my American accent come forth because I, you know, I, I just, I just feel, I feel assimilate. I feel myself better when I'm in India, I speak in that accent. So we are able to switch back and forth, but with the dance, I think. I think definitely the dance has been dance and music have definitely been a major part of making us um, uh, stick to our culture. Mm. And um, mm. Mm. but maybe even if I did not have the dance, I think through prayer and through going to the temple, going to the temple and going for religious functions is an integral part of the Indian. Uh, upbringing that we have you know we have to we do certain things in the morning like lighting a lamp you have a prayer little prayer area and we do the lighting of the lamp and we we say a little bit of our um, a holy chants you know you read some scriptures and so i think for the most of us because this is so deep rooted within us i think we would have still stuck on to the indian culture even if i did not have my dance and music but um it, it it's it but i think on the flip side the dance and music have been an integral part of making mm -hmm. us even more aware of our culture and uh, trying to hold on to what we have at our home away from home absolutely and I, and i agree with you when i go home to scotland you know i and it, even saying the word scotland yes, uh, yes. my accent switches and yes. i always find that the first day in scotland Everybody I hear, I think, are speaking with an American accent. And then <laughs> when I come back home to America, I think everybody I hear is speaking with a Scottish accent. So, Scottish accent. yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that. Um, Johnny, uh, Shoba was talking about how it's very much a part of community um, with culture. And Johnny, you're very, very active within your community. You know, you're the VP for communications for the, the OCA Cleveland chapter. Um, how important do you think it is for being part of a community to be able to maintain your culture? I think it's our identity. It's part mm -hmm. of our life and we should never forget about where we come from. It's mm -hmm. also a way to understanding because of where we're coming from, we understand where we're going to heading forward. It's part of, of in, the, in the way to, to identify who we are. America is a great country. It's a great world, city. It's a great, um, sorry, country-wise. And we are composed as a diversity group of different people and race. 
So that doesn't mean that anybody of us, even though we're born in Cleveland or, or immigrate Cleveland, we we should have our own identity because that's what who we are, and that's what makes, especially Cleveland-wise, a very rich city where we all can be uh, working together as a group, not because of our race, working together because of our talent, because of our skill, because of our friendliness against each other, and so on and so on. So I don't think it should be something that we need to forget. Um, there has been example of people forgetting their past, but then when they, I know there are a lot of Chinese students who were born here, but then trying to go back to their root, so understanding where they're coming from. And that's just something very useful in the sense of um, finding the identity, who you are, and connect with that. We just did a documentary about this, and we did talk about some uh, concern that families have with the kids, where they are, uh, they are uh, Chinese, Polish, and uh, Black. So the kid grew up in that kind of environment and they need to find a way to identify who they are. Mm. So that's, it's, a, it's very important to, to be able to connect ourselves with the past so we can learn about it and move forward to the future. Well, that, that's wonderful, Johnny. That's the whole uh, motto of our Culture Share event this week, you know, where I'm from and where I'm going. Yep. And, you know, one thing that Tri-C does really well with our ESL population is that we give them a foundation which we're able to build from um, by learning English so they can find themselves a place in their American community. Um, Agatha, you took part in the Tri-C ESL program and uh, you're a graduate from the Women in Transition program. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences with Tri-C? Um, all of the good things. I mean, I love Tri-C. That's where the future begins. <laughs> I really do like Tri-C. I have built my um, confidence um, with connection with America in so many levels uh, during my programs at Tracy. That one in transition a couple of years ago was a big awa um, and, and a big um, eye-opening moment because it really was uh, helping me to reflect on some things and uh, move forward. And as far as the English as a second language, my um, experience is probably very similar to many people, I mean, at least the people that I know from Polish community. Uh, many people come or came uh, right now. We do not have that many, um, that big immigration that is really uh, coming from Poland at this moment. So uh, I'm going to go back to that. But English as a second language, when you come without literally no words, by mm. and high. So mm. Johnny, uh, on the other hand, is very um, lucky here because uh, he reminds, I mean, he represents for me a generation like my son. He was born here and he kept the language and he can say, I'm Polish, right? And, and that's what he's saying, I'm, I'm Polish. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. I, sp I, I smile inside, and or not only inside. Uh, be, he's really Polish. I mean, a Polish mom, Polish dad, I mean, really Polish, right? Um, mm -hmm. Not the first generation because he was born here, but keeping language and he wants to keep his language and he wants to be associated with the culture coming back to the english as a second language well so then you start the program just from the scratch just mm -hmm. from the scratch having the from the first level right like you are mm -hmm. on a zero hi bye and what else good morning uh, i mean a couple of more yeah. uh, uh, sentences and words and and you really lost and um and then and then you just have a you just have a you just have expectations and you're coming back to the uh, uh, evening classes because mm -hmm. basically when you come at least my situation i had to go to work the work i hated uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the beginning right uh, in america and then after after work you have to drive to the classes and yeah. you, you just want all of this to go faster to happen faster you know yeah. just to be assimilated and that's that's the regular process and uh, and, and the thing is that when you are at school, then the mm -hmm. English grows and you start to feel comfortable or more comfortable mm -hmm. and wow, mm -hmm. oh, oh, my, my English, right? And then when you don't continue and you come back to the Polish community and if you have a Polish family and you speak Polish, then that language that you have really learned during the ESL doesn't mm. stay that fresh with you. That's another mm. um, experience people face. I mean, and I was mm -hmm. facing that too. 
then mm -hmm. I, 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 I went back to school. So, uh, and, I, and I moved forward with uh, uh, many other aspects of my life in a, a simulation with America. So that's why the uh, language started to be like a little bit more fluent than my own, because as a second, as a English as a second language, you just learn up to some point and then what, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, um, absolutely. So, so you, it, have, you have this with your students um, um, a lot. Of course, and yeah. I remember it's, it's... that I had to go back to some ESL. I don't, I, 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 I mean, that was a long time ago. I think that I had to go back and repeat one level <laughs> because I didn't remember the grammar well. <laughs> well, it's absolutely fine. I often say there's uh, some grammar points which native speakers have trouble with too. Um, Shoba, um, Agatha was just talking about how, you know, sometimes when you first come to America, you wish for your to be able to learn the language faster. And you've been here for uh, a number of years. Do you find that your attitude towards your culture has changed over the years and that you may have become less or even more inclined to uh, keep a strong tie with your own culture? I think the, the generation, our my generation that moved in here, mm -hmm. uh, we call ourselves frozen in time actually mm -hmm. so when i go back to india i'm actually shocked at the changes mm. in india i i even have a culture shock when i go back to india because i have when my children were growing up i would i have two boys and mm -hmm. uh, um again there is a cultural difference between the way the boys grow up in india and the girls grow up in india and uh, there, there, there has to be, I'm sure, Johnny, uh, you know, I'm sure it's like that with the Chinese culture too, where the girls are expected to behave and uh, do certain things in certain ways. And the boys can get away with a lot of things just because they're boys. And um, taking them back to India or even my students, I've heard this from a number of people that go back to India when, when they take their daughters back. They tell them things like, oh, you know, when we go to India, I don't want you to wear uh, spaghetti strap dresses, tank tops, or because nobody will be wearing those things there. And these girls will, you know, much against their wishes, go back to India and try to wear the clothes that they're expected culturally to wear there. Mm -hmm. But then they realize that the people there are not adhering to any of these principles and they come back home and say why did you force me to take all these clothes when nobody else there everybody else there is wearing tank tops and uh, you know and uh, and whatever they were not supposed to wear here so it's definitely a different um, um for me i think a lot of times my my children will tell me that too when we have our cultural arguments at home uh when we expect them to do certain things uh, in mm -hmm. a certain way, and uh, and when we do speak to friends, we all realize that uh, we are all still stuck in the in the India that we left behind, mm. maybe in the eighties, mm. and that mm -hmm. India is just this India is just so different. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so yes, I mean, I feel I I sometimes feel like a stranger even when I go there because I mm. don't. Mm. I, because there have been so many changes that I'm not accustomed to, and maybe I'm not willing to accept those changes. Sure. And uh, I think uh, that itself is, so we, we call, sometimes we would think our children were confused because of the two cultures, but mm. I think not. I think we are the ones that are confused because, uh, because we want to hold on to certain things from the culture, which maybe don't even exist anymore. Excellent. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's a very good point that we we have our culture in our mind. Yes. Um, yes. Johnny, do you find that uh, we tend to pick parts of our culture out that we wish to keep going, but there are other parts of our culture that we leave behind? I try. <laughs> there is a lot of um, just a little background about myself. My father was a diplomat for the Taiwanese government. Mm -hmm. So in doing, he went through the World War II and went through the whole different um, um, unfortunate thing that happened in China against the Japanese, uh, Japanese American, Japanese against Chinese. 
Mm -hmm. So we grew up in a very diplomatic environment. So there is a lot of brainwashing going on. So in my perspective, I try not to uh, remember the things or do the things that he forced me to do in the sense of uh, because of the uh, nationalist perspective that he has, that he want me to also to hate all the China, uh, all the Japanese that invaded China, which that's not true because it was a it was a war. It was something that the the, the Japanese or uh, Japan emperor decided to do, but it had nothing to do with all each individual person that lives in Japan. Uh, for me, when I grew to the age where I actually understood the whole differences, it was a shock for me in the sense of uh, be friend with Japanese um, Americans here in Cleveland. With the weirdest, the funniest thing was I got a very good friend who happened to be a Japanese person, American here, and he brought me into their Japanese American Citizen League as a editor for the newspaper. So okay. that makes a huge difference into the the different culture that I had to experience in with the, the Asian American Parliament, and learn me uh, got me into the way of understanding not to hate people because what they did in the past, but rather embrace with the best thing to have each in the, in the individuals and moving forward. And that's a very good uh, learning process for me. And at the same time, I do the same thing to my sister, who's being married with three kids who have no no recollection of the Chinese culture whatsoever. So it's something that I hope that she will eventually teach them about. But I guess the most important part is for them to be able to learn. The mother had to do something about it beforehand, but not until when they become teenagers, very rebellious, and they don't want to learn anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, the generational differences in culture. But but first, I just want to ask, um, when we're talking about, you know, uh, Shoba said very correctly that our culture is kind of frozen in time. And uh, Johnny mentioned about how people forget parts of culture. Um, Agatha, do you ever find there's a tension between what you think of as your culture and what are some stereotypes of your culture? And do you ever feel that sometimes people think of your culture in a stereotypical way and you have to educate them? That's actually a very good question. Um, but I would like to go back to what uh, Shaba said. Mm -hmm. It's really about this culture being frozen. This is what so many people experience. I experience that all the time. Like Poland has changed a lot, like dramatically. Uh, compared to the time when I was there and I was in school and the moment when I was emigrated to the United States. Uh, one of the author uh, who is contributing to our magazine, he wrote a um, story about the title was, I remember, the museum of the present time. Because that's how we live, actually, you know, that like we really think that this is how it is, because that's what we remember. And we are kind of shifting between two different worlds. There is the identity, like in me, I have that I'm Polish and the identity that I am assimilated with America. Some of the things I like in America much better than in Poland. And then I miss the things in Poland. Uh, answering your question about the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, one of the subject uh, related to the Polish culture that I think uh, um, it, it really needs to have a lighter light on, on it because uh, like uh, going in the back in a history when we were associated with so many Polish jokes and they were so painful for people and they still um, they still are being active uh, in a society. I personally do not take it personally, even when my clients sometimes make a joke, I say to them, hey, listen, I mean, it, it, you will not hurt me because I'm not being really strictly connected only to my culture, but some, for some people, this is everything. And, and uh, those are the, those are the moments when, um, I would like to say, well, that's a really big stereotype. It's not like that anymore. It's not like that anymore. Actually, uh, Polonia as a Polonia is experiencing right now the situation like the really uh, is not much the new immigration because the country is uh, uh, prospering pretty well and um, people stay in a country. People don't have to leave. They are being educated and they have a future there. Um, 
there is like you probably uh you're probably aware of uh um lately the information about poland poland being a very uh, close uh, minded culture and i would say yes uh in a, some aspect this is this is not uh it's a not diverse country or diverse community so that's pretty easy to be close in a in a in a one point view in a one religion one culture and then if I would connect this with uh, American point of view, I mean, I cannot find myself there. Um, what's about what's about stereotypes? The one, uh, of course, about the uh, war, World War II, when uh, some people still uh, say uh, that uh, Poland is uh, responsible for the Holocaust because they do not really know or understand the history yes there is a part of the history that poland is responsible for but let's face the truth that was not polish uh, polish uh, camps they were located in poland right so the holocaust uh being associated only with poland um it's just a little bit painful for polish people to digest and i and i and i absolutely agree with them um the stere stereotypes you probably also know that st stereotypes uh, that uh, drinking like polak oh this is my number one that i cannot even take it which i mean because of my profession but um on the other hand of course i don't like the drinking culture in poland i know mm -hmm. where is this coming from i know how it was i was born there i was mm -hmm. raised there uh, people were drinking alcohol in a regular basis every day that's the culture in poland that's how it was under the communism that's how we grew up and then there is an effect of that you know i mean the mm -hmm. next generation and next generation and we need to be aware of that and and right now this 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 aspect is is uh is changing in a little mm -hmm. bit positive way i would say and that uh stereotypes still exists mm -hmm. the other one and right now i'm gonna stop uh, or maybe maybe not this one. I didn't want to, but uh, being being proud of being Pol being Polish. You know, there are mm. times in 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 uh, in life or in history when uh, people would say, um, "Well, that phrase is um, having different uh, spectrum or a different meaning for me." So right now, for example, I particularly. I am proud of what Poland is doing for Ukrainian people. I am mm -hmm. proud to hear all of the good things in the American media. I mm -hmm. am proud to be able to say, wow, really, it's a very big thing because it's a tough situation. Poland is completely yeah. um, covered by uh, refugees right now. And, 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 and they, do, they do to those people what uh the europe or the world haven't done for them during the yeah. war the, the in a yeah, that's that's an excellent point about that yeah i mean being proud of your culture and having to deal with the negative aspects which you just mm -hmm. talked about agatha with the stereotypes um shoba do you feel that you have a responsibility to represent your culture and do you feel sometimes there are situations where people will look to you to answer questions about your culture as though you essentially are the uh, only person who can tell them. Mm, yes, I mean, like, I am proud to represent my culture, especially when we come to, uh, uh, I mean, we, we, we have the children performing in a lot of, play, in, in a lot of, uh, uh, places with, uh, with predominantly a white audience. So at, in those places, yes, absolutely. I think I I very proudly represent my culture because when people come and ask me certain questions, I have to be able to uh, tell them what this culture is all about. And I try to educate my students so that they can answer them and say, hey, this is what what we did and this is what we are doing as far as the culture goes and um yeah i mean in in a, in in a nutshell maybe my son like you know just got married this on saturday mm -hmm. he married um 
um, a, a, a white girl and uh, she's part Polish and part uh, uh, Italian. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this week, the past weekend was, <laughs> was was a lot of cultural questions that were being answered because they they did do a they, they did do an American style wedding, but still we did we did put in a few uh, Indian um, uh, uh, customs uh, mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. it like for the previous couple of days wherein we did the henna and we did something else and so so yes I I think I I had to answer a lot of questions some of the que some of the cultural questions actually traditional questions which I myself don't know. And I'm, I'm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I think when we grew up and when we were told to do certain things, we just did it without questioning. Our mm -hmm. children don't do, don't do those things anymore. Because mm -hmm. I've had these conversations with my boys when they will say, if you don't know why you're doing it, why do you want us to do it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Yeah. So that that's that with the cultural thing. Yes. And uh, but I think because we have the temple here. And mm -hmm. um, uh, we have the Hindu temple. We have a couple of Hindu temples here. I think a lot of people um, uh, from, I, I see a lot of students from Kent State University or from Tricy coming into the temples to get some kind of an education mm -hmm. with, uh, with the Hindu culture. And we do have somebody there that kind of educates them. So when you talk about the, the culture, when you talk with, there are two variations here. We are talking about the the, uh, the culture as defined by Hinduism, and then you're taught the religious culture, and mm -hmm. what I represent is more of the of uh, traditions in dance, and and as far as uh, a dance and music and uh, an artistic culture. I think yeah. I I would I would say I represent more of the artistic culture and not more of the religious culture. But do you feel that you're able within the artistic culture to modify or or change? uh what are some of the uh more traditional elements and to adapt them for yes. uh yeah and can you Ab give me an absolutely. example absolutely i think um uh, i think i have adapted a lot in the sense that uh, uh we do we do a lot i mean we used to call it fusion my 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 teacher my w would probably call it fusion confusion <laughs> but uh, yes. I, but I tend to think of it as something that needs to be done be only because sometimes the very very traditional aspects of what I do is is very hard for the layman to understand what is being done. So I modify certain things depending on the audience. Mm -hmm. If I have a predominantly Indian audience that that I know is going to understand what I do. I will stick to very, very traditional items, which, mm. which may be very boring for the layman because it's, it's not hard. It's not possible for me to explain everything that I'm doing on stage. So mm -hmm. when I have a, a, a slightly multicultural audience, I might take up like songs, you know, we might just fuse different songs mm. and, uh, and then do a little bit of a dance to that like we did something for the uh my students have performed twice for the halftime show for the cleveland Cavs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and for that if i were to do a very traditional item when you have forty thousand people sitting there none of them are going to understand what we're really doing except for the fact mm -hmm. that the costumes are pretty and you know that's that's all they, they can think about but so i will take i know the purists might not might object to basically what I'm doing sometimes, mm -hmm. but again, I choose to uh, uh, to pick where I'm doing what, and then I'm very careful not to offend the mm -hmm. the purist, and uh, at the same time, to make the the mainstream aware of what we are doing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, <laughs> excellent answer. Yeah, and um. You know, we're talking quite a lot about some of the responsibilities that we have and some of the um, experiences that we've had. But uh, I want to just focus a little bit on the benefits. Um, Johnny, can you talk a little bit about the benefits for you? Obviously, all of us, our work is partly connected to our culture. But what are some of the personal benefits for you by maintaining your culture? The most important part, I think, would be understanding the different perspective of different things. There's no black and white in anything. 
and sometimes you have to uh, see the both sides of the story to be able to make a conclusion. You can mm -hmm. you can hear about certain story about a certain culture, but then if you don't understand the culture, you'll be assimilated or understanding that that is only one fact. But everything does not have just one side of the story, so it's very important, and that's very beneficial for me. So being a bit being a Chinese American, I see the side of the Americans where when there's an issue with China, for example. But then I can see the side from China why mm -hmm. to feel like this is something that shouldn't be considered as an issue just because I work with Chinese a lot and from China and I can see their perspective of what it costs, what they consider as a, a certain things. So mm -hmm. you kind of have to learn, see the both sides of the story before you can make a, a final conclusion. And that's what I like to do. I like to, to do a lot of research. I like to go into uh, understanding both sides of the story before I make any judgment call of, of my own, which we shouldn't do, but we always do that as a human being. And so I think this is very beneficial for me in the sense of understanding the different side of culture. And then I can use that perspective to educate the people who do not understand. Like Sean, I mentioned earlier, she she uh, plays certain type of dance form forms based on the audience. So she is finding the benefit of that and benefit of the good part of it to to make the so the, the audience doesn't get bored. And we we have to we the more we em embrace our culture, our background to the to the general masses or the American here, the more we can understand and, and teach them, show them the differences, and so they don't quickly judge and have those different hate crime happening in the world. Good. Yeah, that's an excellent answer. Excellent answer. And yeah, I think we all agree that our experiences have helped us to get a, a broader perspective of the world. Yeah. Um, but one of my last questions before we have a, a Q&A is, um, would you give guys have any advice um, for somebody who has just, or is in the first year or first couple of years of living in America about maintaining their culture or about keeping their culture and, you know, the difference. And Agatha, you mentioned it's earlier it's about the tension between integration and assimilation. Um, what advice awful. would you, yeah, what advice would you give to somebody who just arrived in America? So let, let me go first, because I was thinking about this question um, and I, and I'm going to go back to my experience. Um, my advice would be, don't be afraid of America. America has so much to offer and it's, uh, it's a blessing to be in a country which is allowing people coming here to be the part of the community, to be the part of actually of everything, because America doesn't require uh, the complete uh, give up on your culture. America is 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 expecting is asking for the integration of the culture, which which is always, in my understanding, it's which is always a benefit for both cultures, because we bring something to America. America gives something to us, and then, as Johnny said there is a um, bigger, bigger picture. I mean, we can see our existence as a, as a, as a something different. So when I came to America, I really, um, I cannot even, I cannot even imagine how was that possible, but I was known for a person that uh, uh, don't want to try anything new. Like literally, I don't know for how many years I haven't tried the American cheesecake, which I can die for right now. Or I wouldn't try the, what was it, carrot cake or a pumpkin pie, mm. because I oh. was so mm. closed. I hold mm. on. I mean, I was at the different stage of my life. Also, you know, the, the, the personal life and this entire immigration, it was very tough for me. I was mm. completely close and, and I wanted to hold on on the past and that really didn't work for me. And I it really didn't work for me. I wish I would start to be more open from the moment I entered the, the uh, United States. My husband, on the other hand, he came and he was not um, he was not holding on, and, uh, and uh, even though he's very connected with Poland, much more than I am, uh, but he was not holding on on a Polish culture. He was open to experience something new. So for him, like the the, the Christmas tree, the Christmas tree, like. Uh, 
Mm. We we set up after the Thanksgiving and, and the day after the um, Christmas, the tree is gone, right? Mm -hmm. This is something unbelievable in Poland, you know, because they just have a different tradition. And uh, as a generation, when I came, the tradition in Poland was like the tree was uh, there till the second of, um, because of the religion, because of the tradition to the second of February. Can mm -hmm. you imagine like all of the dust and the past actually, the past of the season is standing in your house, but this is not the past of the season. This is just the tradition that we lived by. So when he came for him, that was really normal. Okay, America, America, we have this holiday, we have, that was very easy for him. And, and I was learning, wow, I wish I would do that 15 years ago. So advice is don't be afraid of America. Take what America has to offer. Keep your culture, keep the best out of it, but don't close the door and 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 and, and like really take as much as you can. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you guys. That's, that's wonderful. I mean, we've learned a lot today. And uh, you know, I think you guys have had some wonderful perspectives and wonderful um sharing of your experiences, which has really benefited. Our students, we, we have a few questions now. Um, and our first question comes from Sona. And I think I should be directing this to you, Shoba, because you've just been talking about your son's wedding. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah. How Sona asked, how can we transfer our culture to our children who are born here? Um <laughs> maybe you should be asking my children that question <laughs> and not me. Because you know, I I was with the answer about what what we need to do in order to be um, accepted in the society or how, how not, you know, we just spoke about that. I just have a little something to say as far as um, as far as assimilating into the culture or I think as Indians, I don't know. I, I think some if if anybody else is listening to me, they might be offended by what I say, but um, I think we can be a little elitist when it comes to our culture. I'm talking about just from our point of view. So my advice to the to the people that come in here and have children here and who want your children to be part of the mainstream is don't I, I, don't just keep them close to just your culture. Mm -hmm. Expose them to mm -hmm. to the main to the culture in America too. And it's not, I mean, there is no such thing as an American culture. So we, mm. I think we are all just, everybody's assimilating. It's going to be a melting pot pretty soon. And it, it already is. And uh, I think we all have something positive to take from each other's mm. cultures. Mm -hmm. And yeah. rather than keep your children just um, uh, trying to tell them this is what the Indian culture is, or this is what you absolutely have to do. This is this is the way you need to dress. I think we have to be aware of the fact that our children need to go out into the mainstream. They need to be in high school. They need to be in colleges, and for that, they have to be a little more open-minded about uh, being part of the whole system and not just part of your house or your. Uh, traditions, which is great. I mean, uh, so to answer Sona, I think it's great that you, we educate our children on our culture and our traditions. But if they tend to deviate a little bit towards the other cultures, we should not have, don't take it personally. But because mm. I think children really want, they want to be, I mean, it's hard enough for them, uh, especially as, as children of color, being mm -hmm. brown and uh, being part to try to be part of the mainstream and try to be accepted with their other friends and be invited for things for the other for, with the other friends i know because my children did go through that and mm -hmm. uh, my children are now 32 and th or 32 and 29 mm -hmm. and um, for them it's it, it wasn't easy growing up but then mm -hmm. but i think we were to blame a little bit too because we tried to contain them to uh, to to the Indi to our culture, and mm -hmm. I think if I were to do it again, I would do mm -hmm. it a little differently. Well, that's 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 excellent because that brings us on to our second question, which is from Sarah uh, and Shoba. This is again for you, and it's a sort of follow up, which is: uh, uh, Have your children surprised you in how they've asked or wanted to find out more about your Indian culture? I think it's the other way around. They have surprised me with. How much they want to know about the other 
cultures that are mm. around here because mm. I think they knew enough about the Indian culture because that was kind of drilled into their heads when they were growing up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. for me, I think my children have always been, uh, they, they have never brought home friends of just Indians. They have never hung out with just the Indian children. For mm. me, my mm. children have been, they have people, they have friends from all over mm -hmm. who, have, who have always visited home. We made sure that, you know, we, we, we gave them a taste of the Indian culture. And by taste, I mean, literally, I think the Indians are very proud of the food that we make too. And we kind of tend to, uh, um, <laughs> make, make, make people eat our Indian food, very proud of the culture and very proud of the food that we cook. And oh, yeah. I think my children more than, more than asking me about Indian culture, I think they've surprised me about how accepting they have been of other cultures. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's probably the, the number one takeaway that we have uh, from today is how, while we maintain our culture, it's actually enabled us to grow uh, and to incorporate more cultures and to learn more about different cultures, which is almost a paradox that we're holding on to something, but by doing so, it opens us up to more things. Um, we have one last question um, from Nick, and this is a question for any of you guys, uh, whoever wishes to take it, uh, which is, do you find yourself identifying with parts of your native culture now that you live in the US, which you didn't identify or appreciate back in the past? Um, I, I, I think that I would like to respond to this question and mm -hmm. actually, if I'm here and I didn't have a chance, like, like, you know, I'm holding this magazine in my hand because, of course, I'm very proud of the organization that I belong to. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so this is a Polish American cultural center. And this weekend, actually, and I'm using this moment to invite everybody who would like to get to know a little bit more of the Polish uh, culture. This weekend we celebrate Polish Constitution Day, um, actually in in Cleveland, because that's that's the weekend of celebration here in Parma. Because in Parma, maybe you some of you know, um, there is a Polish village, uh, and we have a Polish American Culture Center historically located in a Slavic village, and we have a taste of a Polish culture there on Saturday, where there is a museum. People can come. People can visit the museum. They get get to know about the history they can meet the polish authors that they are writing the books in polish language here and they are the parts of the polish american culture center too but answering that question this is this is how i am uh, how i am answering that question i think that i am more um um connected with the polish culture because i'm here and with the polish history then I would be if I would be in Poland. That's what I'm observing in people. They take it for granted. And of course, they have a different perspective because they live there. You know, that's their everyday, everyday story. And here we hold on and we um, somehow there is a treasure. And for some people, there is a, such a treasure, you know, some mm. of the members of the center they remember the World War Two. That's mm. a huge thing, you know, and 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 I think that this is this is actually my answer for this question, you know, holding on some parts of the culture that I I think I wouldn't hold on if I would be regularly a part of Poland. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Well, listen, guys, we're we're at the end of our time. We're at the end of our session. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much to our panelists and to the participants who've been listening. Um, and I feel like uh, for me personally, I've learned quite a lot about you guys and about your cultures, but uh, about the main takeaway is how we may come from different cultures, but we all have the same journeys. Yes. And we're all moving towards the same thing, which is a exactly as you said, Shoba, it's a, a melting pot of communities. And as you said, Agatha, this is one of the best things about America is that we're in a place where we can all work together. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much um, to, Shoba, very much. to Agatha, to Johnny, um, and to our participants. This has been recorded, so you can always find this uh, on the Tri-C website. And uh, for everybody who's been taking part in the Culture Share Week here at Tri-C, we thank you very much, and we wish you all the blessings moving forward. Have a great weekend, everybody, and take care. Okay, you thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you, so you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Oh. Hello, hello. Oh. 